Hello, I wanted to make this video to describe how forest carbon credits are actually issued. What the process is to go from wood to an actual carbon credit. Because that, <coughs> because that, uh, <coughs> uh, because, because that, uh, because that I'm just some carbon, just some tubular carbon, and I'm slated to be shipped to the mill. And it's a long, long journey from the trees to the city. And I've been rescued by some folks who took pity, but I hope to be a credit someday. And I hope and I pray that I will be preserved to fulfill someone's offsetting bill. <laughs> you were drinking, I would have stopped you. How many did you have? So the process by which carbon offsets are actually registered and created starts obviously with the landowners. And anyone can own the land. Uh, usually it's NGOs, communities, timber companies, or even small landowners. And the process of analyzing a carbon credit actually should start here because there's a big difference. If you've watched my previous videos, you know that I'm not too wild about NGOs who are already preserving the carbon, receiving credits for these things. You also know that sometimes communities are not able to really police their own projects. Uh, and then, of course, sometimes timber companies will be planting these trees anyway. So the analysis has to start at the very beginning. Now, all forest carbon credits are actually created by what are known as verification bodies. And what these guys do is they actually create a series of protocols or a series of rules that you have to follow in order to enroll your land for carbon offsets. There are about five big verification bodies out there. Vera is the biggest, and they're the responsible one for all the avoided deforestation projects out there. Climate Action Reserve is another one. The California Air Resources Board is a big verification body, but it actually serves the compliance market. And then the American Carbon Registry is a big one in the United States. And then finally, there's Gold Standard, who occasionally does some forest carbon, but mostly does other types of carbon projects. Now, the important thing to note is that not all of these carbon bodies are equal, right? So I've rarely seen a, a good carbon project come out of the American Carbon Registry. Vera projects are 50-50, but Climate Action Reserve projects and California Air Resource Board projects, they're pretty good. I've rarely had an ish issue with any of them. So the verification bodies have created the set of rules, the set of protocols, and they're very complex. They involve, you know, creating difficult inventories and, and mapping out uh, causes of deforestation and, and creating like maps of hydrology they're probably too complex. So no landowner can actually deal with this set of rules by themselves. And so what a landowner does is they will then go to a third party, uh, a contractor called a project developer. And project developers, what they will do is they will basically fill out all, every, all the required information for these verification bodies in exchange for some chunk of the carbon credits. And they take a pretty big chunk, sometimes as much as 50%. Now, carbon project developers that are out there inc include folks like South Pole, Biophilica, Wildlife Works. In the United States, the biggest carbon developer is Finite Carbon, owned by BP, uh, and Blue Source. Now, the, the project developers themselves, they're responsible for putting together the carbon project for a particular forest, for a particular chunk of land. They rarely have on staff everyone that's required to measure the forest. So they will often consult with local contractors to basically get these projects ready to do the inventories. The whole process can take up to two to three years. The fastest I've ever seen a carbon project get done is, uh, you know, six to eight months. But usually we're talking about a process that's more than a year long. So it's tremendously complicated. Next, once a project developer has put together a packet of information, a project description for a project, they need to consult with an independent verifier. Now, these are verifiers that are kind of certified by the registry bodies as being independent, who can then consult on whether or not the project is, you know, doing what it should and, and sign off on it. These guys include folks like SCS Global, Rainforest Alliance, uh, NSF International, Environmental Services, Astor Global. Um, but there's a real question about how independent these verifiers actually are. The American Carbon Registry, for example, only has four verifiers that they allow. Uh, so four verifiers for all their carbon projects. One thing to keep in mind is that these verifiers are being hired by the project developers themselves to sign off on these things. Verifiers, they're great people. I mean, I have friends who have worked as verifiers, but they hate rejecting forest carbon projects. They hate when they come up with issues. You know, they're not necessarily creating 
independent reports on the pros and the cons of these projects. They're just trying to sign off on these things as quickly as possible. And so a lot of verifiers, for example, you know, maybe they've got a week or two to, to figure out all the nuances of this project and sign off on it. And they really hate it when projects go wrong. And so if something goes wrong for these verifiers while they're verifying, they do their best to make sure that the project gets verified anyway. Because, you know, if something does go wrong, you know, a week long verification turns into a month long verification. So are these verifiers really independent? Absolutely not. And that's why these carbon projects have so many flaws, because the independent verifiers uh, are not verifying at all. Now, once again, verifiers don't hire their own, you know, people to go out into the field very often. They rely on contractors to go out and actually measure the trees and do all the forest mensuration and whatnot. And again, we have yet another middleman in this process who's taking a chunk. All right, so our carbon project has been developed and it's been verified. And now the registry body has issued credits. The verifiers and the contractors and the uh, project developers have all taken their chunks out of, the, out of the project. But whatever credits the landowner is left with, they can now sell. Now, this is where the next group of people come in. Because landowners don't really want to go around trying to sell their, their individual forest carbon credits you know, to companies that are trying to offset their credits. Uh, so landowners will sell their carbon credits to brokers. And brokers will then do all the sales. Traditional brokers include folks like Nori, TerraPass, Cool Effect, CTX Global, and they don't really do anything. They're really just basically used car salesmen. Listen, now I've got these carbon credits, and this is a once in a lifetime opportunity. These things are selling like hotcakes, and old Shelly, old Shelly has got an opportunity for you. These things, they're going to be worth 10 times as much as they are. Now, I know that you pledge to offset your carbon emissions by 2050. How are you going to do that? you got to start this thing early. We're going to get these carbon credits all settled away for you. Now, granted, I understand that there's a need for somebody to go and sell these carbon credits, but they are taking yet another chunk out of, out of the process, and it's not uncommon for them to, to take something like 10 or 20% commission. Those are the traditional brokers, and they've been around for decades. What's happened in the last couple of years is because these carbon projects have so many flaws a lot of the time, uh, a new set of brokers have popped up, and they're basically tech brokers. Uh, and tech brokers, what they do is that they not only do they buy and then resell carbon credits, and take a commission off that, they also add value by acting as actual independent verifiers. So because the, the, the registry protocols verifiers are so biased, you know, nobody can really believe what they say. So these other projects have kind of cropped up. Some examples of these tech brokers are Pachama, Silvera. Carbon Plan will review projects, though they don't actually sell credits. They just take money for reviewing projects. One of the problems with these guys is that their reviews are never public. So, I mean, if a carbon project is really failing, shouldn't the whole world know about it? You know, these folks, Pachama, Silvera, they're really only tailoring themselves to these mega companies, these Fortune 500 companies. And so you can really only get this information if you happen to be a Fortune 500 company. But, you know, realistically, the whole world should know whether or not a forest carbon project is good or bad. The other issue with these reviewers is that, you know, of the three that I listed, I don't think any of them have a public methodology. I worked at Pachama. I know they have a very good private methodology, a very good rubric, uh, but they don't release that methodology to the public. And so it's very difficult to say whether or not these reviewers are looking at the right things. Um, now, you know, another question is, you know, how much tech do these tech brokers really have? Trust me, I have a PhD in remote sensing. I, I did my PhD work in deep learning of three-dimensional LiDAR point clouds. I know a thing or two about, you know, remote sensing tech for forests. A lot of these brokers, you know, basically all the ones that I've listed are just reading the project description, summarizing it, and then often just summarizing global forest watch data that's already publicly available. Um, this isn't necessarily a bad thing. Somebody needs to look at global forest watch data and review these projects and make sure that they're okay. Uh, but also, I mean, you know, compared to academia, this isn't exactly cutting edge stuff. Consider that there are only about 500 forest carbon projects worldwide. Why can't somebody just, you know, why can't somebody just sit down and make all of these reviews public? That's what I'd really like to see from these folks. And, you know, I, I know that most of my viewer base either works at Pachama, works at Silvera, or, or works at another one of these tech brokers. And I'm only, I'm only being critical here because I think you guys can do better. 
you know, you, you guys got to hire more forest carbon experts, more remote sensing experts. So raise the bar a little bit. I think the problem with these tech brokers is that the lowest hanging fruit is, is basically to use the public data sets, sign off on these projects and resell credits. But, but I know that you guys can do better. All right, so the broker has, has made the sale, right? Uh, who is he selling it to? One of the folks that he's selling it to are traders. And, and these are basically like Wall Street institutions that are more or less speculating that forest carbon credits are gonna be worth more in the future. The traders that I've interacted with have all been very, uh, let's say low tech. They really haven't been sophisticated. They've just been interested in snapping up the cheapest credits. And let me tell you something, this is a big mistake because any old asshole could post a video online about how a forest carbon project has failed. I'm the asshole. I'm the any old asshole who could be, who okay. could be. No, I'm the asshole, come on. So traders should really be doing their research before they buy carbon credits from a particular project. Otherwise that project could be worthless in the future. There's my warning to you Wall Street types. Finally, you know, we come to the, the folks who are actually buying these credits to offset their emissions. And buyers vary wildly in sophistication. Some buyers have entire teams devoted to whether or not carbon offsets are, you know, genuine and, and only devoting to the right projects. Microsoft, for example, was one of them. Other buyers really just want to snap up whatever offsets there are, or, or they're really not aware that, you know, some carbon credits are better than others. Ideally, we should have a system in which all carbon credits are, are equal, in which they're all worth the same amount of money. Obviously, we're a very long way from that. If not that, we should have a system where people can just easily Google whether or not these carbon projects are good. At the very least, though, if you're watching this and you're interested in buying carbon credits, do some due diligence. Make sure you buy the credits that are, you know, the right ones. I spend a half an hour shopping for shoes on Amazon. You should spend at least a half an hour shopping to see whether or not the carbon project you're supporting is valid. Uh, I want to talk about some, some folks who are kind of going it alone. And, and what I mean by that is that, you know, this, this whole system that I've described with at least half a dozen middlemen, uh, it's been around for like two decades, but there are a couple of like tech startups that are actually basically trying to create their own carbon crediting systems without, you know, with, without the whole process, just to go straight from the landowner to the person who wants to buy the credit. Overall, I'm in overwhelming support of this, right? Like there's only 500 forest carbon projects worldwide because that we've got such a corrupt and difficult system to work with. That's not gonna stop climate change, right? There need to be 5 million carbon projects worldwide. So some folks going it alone include Indigo Ag, they, they do agricultural uh, carbon credits, terraformation, tree economy. Uh, some of these folks are kind of blurring the lines between selling actual carbon credits versus just planting trees. So it can get a little bit murky. I would say the biggest and, and furthest along of, of the folks who are kind of new to the field and who are going it alone is NCX, formerly known as Sylvia Terra. Now, you know, I, I kind of support what they're doing. I, I really appreciate that they're cutting out all these middlemen, but at the same time, uh, you know, they're not exactly transparent about their methodology. I, I definitely have serious questions about whether or not their one year carbon credits are really additional. What does their remote sensing look like? What are the air maps? This is stuff that's not publicly available. With a normal traditional carbon project, I can go online, look up the project description and tell you exactly what the uncertainty was for the carbon for that particular credit. I can't do this with uh, NCX credits. You know, I support somebody coming in and, and cutting out the middleman and getting rid of, rid of this, this whole bureaucratic nightmare system. But at the same time, if you just have one black box body issuing these credits, you could run into serious issues. So, you know, my hope is that NCX will be a little bit more transparent about exactly what they're doing and exactly the uncertainties involved in this. So there you go. That's the entire uh, carbon crediting offset world. Uh, it's big and complicated. For every example that I listed, there are three or four times that number of folks who are actually in that space. So, so there are probably dozens, if not a hundred plus project developers out there in the world. You know, we need to simplify this system. So again, I support what NCX is doing. I support what Pachama and India Go Ag are trying to do. This system came about because groups like Vera and American Carbon Registry kind of beat everybody out to the punch. They weren't appointed by anybody. You know, the, the state of California didn't, you know, anoint Vera to be like the carbon credit registry body. They just kind of cropped up 20 years ago. 
Uh, we need there to be competition in the market. We need there to be transparency in the market. And we need to dramatically simplify this system so that any old landowner who owns 100 acres could enroll for forest carbon offsets without pay having to pay hundreds of thousands of dollars and more than 50% of the carbon credits that they're actually receiving.